Let me record. Cool. All right. So um, if you need to synchronize with my code at any point in time, you can use these commands that are right here. It's going to be git fetch all and git reset hard upstream slash main. Again, highly recommend copying these and having these somewhere. We'll be using these in pretty much every lecture from here on out because it's going to be the easiest way to get code to you all. And you can do this thing at will. All right, let's jump in. All right, so Mongoose. Um, Mongoose is how we are going to interact with MongoDB. Uh, from within our applications. So Mongoose is a uh, called an ODM or an object data modeling library. Uh, and it works with Node. And it's going to massively simplify how we interact with uh, MongoDB databases. And our uh, Mongoose uh, is essentially going to uh, really allow us to have a much easier time interacting with MongoDB than using uh, kind of MongoDB's thing that they uh, create themselves for Node, which is the MongoDB Node driver. This is the kind of like, um, uh, this is MongoDB's preferred solution that they uh, kind of uh, tout internally to use uh, to build a node app. And uh, it is extremely hard to use and pretty hard to learn. Uh, we don't want to do that to you all. Uh, so therefore, we will be using Mongoose uh, because it is simply so much easier. It's very, um, it, it's uh, really just so much easier to pick up. It's so much easier to learn. Um, there is much less code that you have to end up writing. Uh, and it can do basically everything that you're going to want to do at this level. Um, and actually adds in a few things in addition to um, kind of what uh, this uh, we would get out of the box with this MongoDB node driver. So it's pretty cool in that way. Um, so. Um, Mongoose is what we are going to use whenever we're performing CRUD data operations on a MongoDB database. CRUD, you've heard us say this before. This is an acronym that stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. It represents the four basic operations that can be performed on data in a database. Those four operations are the foundation of most applications that interact with databases. And those allow users to do things such as add, retrieve, modify, and remove information. Basically, whenever you've used, for example, like any social media app is a CRUD app. Users are creating posts. They're updating posts with things like comments and replies. Uh, they might even edit posts as well. Uh, they can delete posts and uh, they're able to look at those posts that they have created. CRUD is everywhere, all around the internet. That is why we are going to be learning it. It is ubiquitous. All right, so um, there is one uh, note that we'll have with Mongoose, uh, and it's going to kind of break with how we have been thinking about MongoDB so far, what we talked about yesterday. Um, and how it does that is that Mongoose is going to provide a straightforward schema-based solution to model your application data. Schema-based. This seems kind of weird. This is not something that we were really kind of expecting whenever we were talking about MongoDB. Yesterday, I was saying that you could put basically anything that you want to 
into a MongoDB database, right? Like there's nothing in there that really cares about what goes in that database. And yes, while MongoDB itself is schemaless and doesn't have any kind of, uh, doesn't really care what data that you put into it, Mongoose is going to allow us to attach a schema to what we are doing. Um, so that schema, again, is, as we talked about yesterday, kind of the, um, it's it's going to be the foundation of what our data looks like, essentially. And the data that we put into the database is going to need to conform to that schema that we write. Now, again, you might look at this and think like, well, now I feel kind of limited inside of this, you know, schema box and what happens if I need to change data through time and all of that. Um, MongoDB itself and Mongoose are very kind of loose with like existing data. So as your like data changes through time, your old data is still going to uh, kind of mostly work with any kind of uh, changes that you make unless you're changing things like data types or stuff like that along the way. So uh, what we're going to need to do uh, is as we are writing out our uh, kind of uh, how our data should look and all of that, we are going to need to kind of think a little bit about what this looks like ahead of time. And again, this is really for our benefit uh, and it is going to make sure that we are uh, you know, even though we're kind of, um, we're beginners at this, it is going to give us some kind of structure because if we didn't have any structure at all, this would really not be a fun experience and you would all probably have a bad time. Uh, yes, Melvin. Just a quick question. Um, what's the idea behind, um, starting in a schemaless system like Mongo and then using Mongoose to make it schema-based rather than just starting with a database that's schema-based to begin with? Great question. So whenever we're in our kind of, um, whenever we're in our uh, kind of MongoDB land, one of the points that um, I made kind of at the start of this with um, making sure that our data can evolve through time easily is really what this is all about for us at the start. Um, so that is kind of the flexibility that we get here. We can change stuff in our database without necessarily needing to delete all of that existing data. Um, we can go and change how our schema looks and still uh, potentially keep existing data around. Now, there are times where that's not true and you will just need to drop a database. That's not uncommon uh, as you're kind of learning through this process. Uh, but it is much more common to have to do that in a SQL database. Uh, and as kind of beginners using a database for the first time, it is simply much easier to uh, kind of have the flexibility, but put a layer of structure on top of it. Good question. All right. Uh, Mongoose does lots of other things for us as well. Uh, so it has cool things like default property values. We have data validation. Uh, we have automatically populated re populating related models via the populate method. This is super cool. This is super awesome. Uh, you're this is like whenever we get here, this is one of the best things for us. Uh, it saves us so much work, saves us so much time. Um, and th this is this is really a pretty awesome feature within Mongoose whenever we get to this point. Um, there's a few other things that Mongoose allows us to do that we'll kind of dive into as we see them as well. Uh, so big picture here. We are going to write schemas. Those schemas compile into models. And then we use the model that is 
com the compiled model to actually access and interact with the database. So how our model files are going to work is that we're basically going to be writing in most of them our schema. That's all going to happen in our model file. But at the very end of our model file, we're going to compile that schema into a model, which we then use throughout our application. The model is what actually gets exported from the model file. That's why it is called a model. That's why we organize them everything into a model directory. Because what will be exported out of these model files are the compiled model. That being said, the actual contents of this file are mostly going to be the schema, as you'll see. So let's kind of take a step back, look at some actual code that we would uh, have for this. In a model file for a cat, so this would be in a new models directory, which we'll make here in a little bit, cat.js, we have this cat schema that is here. And our cat, we can see, is going to have these kind of properties on it, these fields, a name and a breed. These things here make our cat schema. And this is a fairly light schema that we've got going on here. You can think, you know, all of the properties that you would want to put on a um, on a kind of data entity would need to go in here. So this is fairly simple. It is very common to have much more going on in uh, these than this, but this is a, a kind of simple schema. And you can see in the same file, after we've written our schema, we compile that schema into a model. So we have this mongoose.model that we use. We throw in the cat schema here, and then we also provide the name for that model. And this is going to be cat. This is uppercase. What does that typically signify? The class. Object. Class. Class. Yes, class. So we're going to be getting this cat out of here. And then that is going to be exported from this actual file. So here, this whole thing that we've got, this is our model file for our cat. We don't actually have a model until this line, though. And then we're exporting it right after that. So again, commonly in your model files, they're mostly going to actually be schemas. And those get compiled into a model that is then exported from that file. Uh, Kelsey, yes. Is there a reason we don't call them schema files then? Like if it's Be not actually models in this one, like it just sort of seems yep. confusing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I, that's why I'm talking about this so much because it is confusing. The thing that leaves this file, the thing that you have access to throughout the rest of your application is the model. And that is why we call them model files because even though most of this file is made up of a schema, and you don't really get a model until the very end of this file, the thing that leaves the file, the thing that is available to us to import within other files within our application is the model itself. And that is why we refer to this as a model file, even though most of this file, like we've observed, is probably going to be a schema. The thing that leaves is the model. Okay, so a model is made up of schemas, so that's why we still call it a model file. Exactly, yep. 
And you can see that in action here. Here, we are importing the cat model. And then we're using that to do something like create. This is how you'll put something into a database, just like this. We're going to create a cat. It has a name property and a breed property. The name is a string. The breed is a string. And it all exists inside of this object, which we are then using to create a cat. This is all you would need to actually create something in our database. Mongoose is handling everything else. It's handling the connection status. It's handling uh, this interaction that is actually going and creating the cat. It is, it's doing all of the work for you. And all you have to do is say, I'd like to create a cat, please. And we create a cat. Uh, Kelsey. So it's not really um, like that far off from like, let's say the schema that you made is a piece of HTML. And then, you know, you call that piece of HTML or whatever in your JavaScript file and you apply a class to it basically so that you can uh, make things or change things about it similarly to the way we were doing our CSS and JavaScript and HTML connections. Like they sort of interact with each other in a similar way. Obviously it's like different syntax, but like. In a, in a similar way, yes. Um, like on, on paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the mechanisms underneath are all different. Um, but as far as you interacting with this, yes, basically, um, it's going to kind of feel pretty similar to that. Yeah. Good question. Uh, Julian. Uh, can you go back to the section where it's like the mongoose.model and why is the cat in the string again? Ah, right yeah, here. Why, yeah. Yes. Why is that? This is what we want to name this model. So I, even though you have this over here, um, Mongoose needs a way to essentially be able to internally refer to this, this model that we're creating. So that's why we have cat and a string here. Typically, this and this are going to be the same. Then you have no reason to change them. Um, so that's that's kind of what is going on here. Um, this is essentially kind of a helper for Mongoose itself to be able to find this model a little bit better that we're creating. Okay. So essentially, okay. think of it, this is how we will refer to this model. This is how Mongoose will refer to this model. Oh, okay. Thanks. Of course. All right. That takes us to some review questions. I'm going to pull out the picker. All right. In your own words, describe the use case for Mongoose. What is it? Why would we choose to use it? Uh, second question, a Mongoose blank is compiled into a Mongoose model. And three, we use a Mongoose blank to perform CRUD operations on a particular MongoDB collection. Um, let us begin. In your own words, describe the use case for Mongoose. What is it and why would we choose to use it? Rafi. Um, can you skip me for now? Because I joined the Zoom. Yes, I can. Uh, let's go on to the next person. In your own words, describe a use case for Mongoose. Um, it's not here. Melvin. Uh, it's a way for uh, us to translate a schema list based schema list database into a schema structure. Cool. Um, expand on that a little bit for me. How? Uh, how? I guess you want me to expand on it. <laughs> um, what else does it do for us? Uh, that's that's a really good question. Think uh, think wildly high level. If I mean outside of providing like a schema structure, like higher yeah. than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, what is it allowing our application to do? Uh, the, the object data modeling? Sure. Yes, I'll take that. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah, I don't... I no, you're cool. That. You're cool. It's allowing our application to interact with the database. Uh, well, okay. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the simple answer. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, cool. So uh, a mongoose blank is compiled into a mongoose model. Andy. It is schema. That is a schema. And then we use a mongoose blank to perform CRUD operations on a particular MongoDB collection. Uh, Andreas here. Mike. We use Mongoose models to perform CRUD operations. That is exactly right. Good job. All right, cool. So let's actually use Mongoose in these applications that we've got. Uh, I'm going to pull up VS Code, and we're going to install Mongoose. Install Mongoose just like we install any other NPM package into our app with NPMI, type it correctly, NPMI, Mongoose. And we'll see now that in our package.json, we have mongoose. This has been added as a dependency. And we have the mongoose package added into our node modules somewhere in here. Our dependency array grows. All right. So... Next, the connection string that you all got from MongoDB Atlas. So if we swing over to Atlas real quick, let me sign in. Kill my. Um, if I sign in here. And prove to it that I'm a human. That looks like a bus. If I come in here and um, you, uh, as signing up for this process, should have gotten a connection string out of all of out of all of the work that you ended up doing, you should kind of the results of all of that work is this connection string that we get uh, whenever we hit uh, connect here and then click on connect your application. And this is the thing that we kind of told you, hey, keep this safe. We are going to be using it. So this connection string that we've got here is going to kind of be um the basis of how we connect to an application so in here what we're going to do is touch a .env file so that we can put our connection string into our application Now, why do we need a separate file to be able to do this? Well, this file we've previously set up on your machines, this .env file will not be sent to GitHub. So we have in our project, all of this will be going up to GitHub, right? Well, this connection string is how we connect to a database. It has all of the information for our entire application. In a production application, this would likely store things like credit card numbers, people's addresses, things that you do not want to be public, things that you would not want someone else to have access to. Potentially like company secrets, IP, stuff like that. So this 
.env file is going to be a way for us to be able to have this connection string locally in this application, but not have this information go up to GitHub. This is actually, uh, I think this is super cool uh, that we have the ability to do this and say like, hey, this file is kind of isolated only on our machines. And I want to be make sure that all my secrets are put into this file and they're kept safe and they're local to my machine. So what we're going to do is start by touching this .env file. Touch .env. And here is our .env file. And now what we're going to do is put in this database underscore URL equals. You must write this exactly as I have it written here. You cannot deviate from, the, from this at all in any way. Database underscore URL, all caps, no spaces after the URL and the equal sign. So again, database, uppercase, all one word, underscore, URL, uppercase, again, all one word. No spaces anywhere in this file. And then over from Atlas, we're going to, again, copy over this connection string that we have. Again, we get this from going on our kind of uh, database dashboard here to connect, connect to your application, and hit copy. We bring this over into our app, paste it in, and there we go. Now, um, at this point, what I'm going to do is, do we, do we have people that do not have a connection string? Yet, yeah, have you? If you have not signed up for MongoDB, done all of that work, cool. Uh, Kelsey, what you got? Because I know you have fully signed I, up. So I think I I signed up, but I don't know if I like got to follow all the steps because it just didn't. The screens did not look like what they were, and I didn't know where to find the stuff because it just didn't look exactly the same. Um, Weird. Okay. I think I got to a point, sort of close to where I need to be for this. Okay. Cool. Um, I just need to follow along with them. So, I mean, I can, if everything there is, I can read it and I know that I have to copy that specifically, I should be okay, but I'm technically a little bit behind. Okay, that's cool. That's totally fine. Um, that is all right. Um, I think what we'll probably do with you is just get with you later and make sure that you're in a good spot so that you can do this in the future um, and make sure that you're set up correctly. Um, it's weird that, the steps would have deviated that much, but also uh, MongoDB is, can do weird things sometimes. So, yeah, when it asked for like what type of thing are you learning or whatever, I clicked custom and just built in the thing that you said was there, but that option wasn't there. So, I think that changed because that was where I started seeing differences in the screen. And then I was like, okay. not sure what step I was supposed to be on from there. Okay. But I cool. think I kind of figured it out. I think you okay. had to go into advanced settings at that point. Cool. We'll take a look and get you set up, though. Don't worry about it too much. Um, cool. Anybody else in a spot where they're like, hey, where's this connection string thing? How do I get this? What What do I need to have set up? Et cetera, et cetera. Happy to spend a little bit of time on that. Cool. Everybody's good? Okay. All right. So, uh, oh, yes, Mike. Sorry, I was shaking my head. I think that I'm no, getting good. there. I just wasn't quite there yet. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, what I'll probably do is um, let's go ahead. Let's take a break here. 
And if you're behind at all and you don't have this connection string set up yet, um, we can kind of spend a little bit of time here and get you caught up. We're going to do a 13 minute break, meet back up at the top of the hour. Uh, if you're having issues, stick around and we'll get you caught up. Was there, I signed up for Atlas, but then was there a, another document I was supposed to follow afterwards? I feel like I'm missing something. Um. So as part of the sign up, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, it should be, where is that? I believe that that is under lecture material, actually. Uh, so in here, if you signed up and then, um, did these steps in here, um, so getting all of the, basically just going through this, um, you should be at a point, uh, at the end of this where you have this connection string. Lecture material, MongoDB. Okay. All right. Let me double check that. Okay. Cool. Cool. Hey, David. Yes. Um, I'll be honest. I wasn't on Atlas when you first started writing this database URL thing, but I managed to do it all. Um, but cool. I did sign up with GitHub instead of my just standard email. Is That's that okay? Right. That's okay, not a cool. big deal. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yep. No big deal. Um, Kelsey, you want to show me what you've got? Make sure we are. So at this point, we should all have a, um, we should all have our connection string. Good to go. And with this connection string, what we're going to do is insert our password. So this connection string that we've got here right now, it has your username that is right here. This is your user that you created uh, within the database access. So that is this username that is there. And then you're going to insert the password here that you created whenever you built this user. So you have the Atlas account and it has its own username and password or you're using um, something like Google sign-in or uh, GitHub sign-in, whatever, uh, to sign into Atlas itself. But then you have this database access user. And this is the user that you created in this database access pane. That is the username that you're going to use here. And that is the password that you're going to use here in place of all of these characters. You're going to replace all of this from the colon to the at symbol with your password. Mine is horrendously long, so it looks like this. This should not look like this. You should not have these uh, greater than uh, or less than symbols at the start of this. You should remove those entirely. All that should be left in between this colon and the at symbol is your password for this user, again, that you created on this database access page. All right, from here. Uh, yes, Rafi. I cannot hear you. So there's nowhere in the database uh, URL where we specify which cluster we're using. We just put in our username and password. Correct. Yes. Um, your cluster name should be right here. 
that should already be filled in for you uh, and you shouldn't have to add that in yourself. Uh, now, one last piece to get this working. In between this slash and this question mark here, this is where you're going to write your actual database name that you want to connect to. So your database name should be uh, probably centered around the theme of your app, the name of your app, something like that. For this application, this is going to be to-dos. I'm going to have a database named to-dos for this app. Uh, Julian, yes. And that's different from like the cluster name that's in the MongoDB, right? Okay. Yes, exactly. So your cluster is like, the cluster is what is going to hold all of your databases. Your databases inside of them will have all of your actual data. It'll have your collections. It'll have your documents, all of that kind of stuff. But this name is going to be your actual database that you're creating on this cluster here using this user. It all comes together. Now, what I would do at this point is copy this and put it somewhere safe and easy to get to. Because you're going to be able to reuse this connection string through the entirety of this course. For every single app that you build. Your connection string will look almost identical to this. The only thing that you're going to swap out is this word right here. Whenever we start our movies app uh, later on this week, we'll swap this to movies. And now we'll be connecting to a movies database that exists on this cluster. Whenever you, uh, whenever we build a, our Taco Cat app next week, we'll have a Taco Cat database. Whenever you all start on your projects, you'll have a database for that as well. My cool project. And all you'll have to do is swap out this right here. So I want to put to do's in here. And this should be kind of our connection string at this point. You should only have a line one in this app or in this uh, file, rather. You should not have something like this where it says line one and line two. All of this should be held in one line, even if it kind of has to break across lines because your password might be insane like mine. You should only have one line in this file at this point. Again, this should say database underscore URL in all caps without a space after it, then an equal sign without a space after it, and then your connection string. If yours does not look exactly like this, minus some user stuff that will be unique to yours and some cluster stuff that will be unique to yours, you're going to have issues. All right. Let us move on. Uh, Mike, yes. I was just thinking, as, as we move forward, our... Uh, get fetch is not going is going to break everything because now we're going to get yours for this file. Ah, will you though? Oh, because ENV doesn't get pushed to GitHub, so it won't exactly. actually break. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So does that mean that all of the code that you're about to write will work? Because mm -hmm. our ENV is going to be unique. Okay, neat. All right. Very good. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, light bulb. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Very cool. Yes. So whenever you pull down my code, you're not going to have this file be replaced on your machine. Um, and Git will not be tracking this. This file basically just doesn't exist to Git. Uh, so whenever you're pulling down code, that file is not going to be overwritten. Uh, and this file will not exist on GitHub. I can prove that right now. Let me do an add, commit, and push. And I don't think I'll have what has changed here. Get status. Okay, cool. 
Um, a quick question in this profile um, that y'all set up, is it all um, files with a period at the beginning are ignored? No, it is not. Uh, so this, uh, if you recall back on your install fest, um, you made a file called git ignore global. Um, this file right here, this is what is making all of this happen. That is what is specifically making sure that you're not sending up a .env file to uh, GitHub because we have said in this git ignore global Please ignore any .env files that you ever see. I would like to add, okay, cool. don't think you're smarter than the system. I When I first did this, I changed my .env to .env2 because I was switching between two different strings and ended up pushing that second one. So if you don't want it pushed, remove it entirely. M4. Yup. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll kind of see, this is also what is preventing like the node modules directory from being sent up as well. So here, like we have this node modules, therefore node modules is being ignored by Git. Uh, Mike. So then I don't know why Joe was doing that, but if I got to a point where I wanted to do that, could I create a folder called .env and Git would ignore everything in that folder? Or is that just needless complication? You wouldn't want to do that because then you can't actually load it. So how this package is going to yeah. work, we'll, we're, we're going to need to bring in a package here in a moment that actually reads from this .env file. And this .env file needs to be in the same location as this server.js file. OK. Neat. I asked that question without thinking it through, but yeah, no, no, no. that's cool. Other things are going to read it, and that all right, got it. Thank you. Exactly. Yep. No problem. Um, if you run into that situation, realistically, what I would do is pull up like a notepad or something like that, and just paste stuff into that. If you need like a temporary place to hold stuff, Notion is wonderful for that. Um, just you know, a, a place that you can feel free to like hey, I don't need this right now, but I might need it again in the future is invaluable to have just while you're working. So no, that's kind of how I would handle that. We just commented out. We have two lines in our ENV file and ha only have one active at a time. No, um, you cannot comment anything in here out, even though it kind of looks like you can. This is not actually going to be commented out. It will still be read. You could, however, change this variable name. Uh, you could call this dat database underscore URL trash or whatever and now this wouldn't be your kind of primary database url all right thank you totally great questions all righty um so i've pushed up and let's just take a quick moment to confirm up on github um that this is indeed what i'm wanting and we can see that there is no .env file up here. So whenever you pull down my code, you will not get that .env file. Teal, super fun. Um, typically, and I'm not sure at all why it's not happening here, but typically this .env would also be a little bit dimmer, kind of like my node modules text is. Um, I'm not sure why that's not happening. Um, I've refreshed this. I've done the things that I should be doing, but it is not happening. But that's kind of weird. Oh, no. I think it's because you haven't installed .env yet. Possibly? Let's try it. Um, cool. So that's what we're going to do next, actually. Now we need a way to be able to bring this file into our actual application, into our server. So what I'm going to do is install a package that is called .env with npmi .env. Make sure this is actually spelled out D-O-T. 
not dot. You want D-O-T-E-N-V here. And now, in our package.json, you'll notice that we have a brand new dependency called .env. We're just continuing to add in to our dependencies here. And now, to actually have this package read our .env file, we just need to bring it in to our project. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a different import than something that we've used before. It's going to happen above all of our other imports. And all we're going to do is import this .env config.js. And like I said, this is a little bit different than our other pattern that we've developed where we're importing something from a location. Here, we're just importing the location. We're just importing this file. You recall that whenever we import a file anywhere, it is being run. Its contents are being executed. So what's happening whenever we're importing this .env config.js file, is that this file, this config.js file right here, is running. And this file is what is reading from this .env file. So this file in our node modules is running this config.js. And it's putting all of our environment variables that we've got, everything in this .env, this database underscore URL, into an object for us. So that we have access to it within this application. But again, we're not assigning this, what is coming out of this to anything, like we're doing with Express, like we're doing with Logger, like we're doing with our routers. This file just runs once, and then its job is done. We don't need to do anything after that. And you'll see here in a moment how we actually connect to our database using the information that this is provided to our app. So we're going to come in here and we're going to make a new directory called config. And then inside of that directory, we're going to touch a database.js file. So we've got config database.js. Now, remember, Mongoose is handling our entire connection to our database. This connection string that we've put here, this is our connection to our database. This is how someone connects to our database that we've got up in Atlas. So we need to tell Mongoose that this exists, that this is where our database is located. So therefore, in this config database.js file, I'm going to import mongoose for mongoose. And then I'm going to use mongoose to connect to my database. And where the .env package has put this string here, this connection string that I have is on this process.env object.
and on this object, we have our database URL. This process.env is the environment that this application is running in. And we're looking in that environment and we're finding the database URL, the thing that we've got right here in our .env file. So here, Da, 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 da. Where is my annotation? This directly corresponds with this. That's where this is coming from. That's what this entire process has gotten us, is being able to get this string here. Any questions at all about this? Yes, Rafi. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm using the GA profile and it might not be, but um, when I typed in uh, Mongoose.connect Connect Process .env database URL, um, I didn't have a color change for Process .env. It all just uh, read for everything. It, it might be because of your theme. Um, I if I'm using the same theme as the GA profile, so that's kind of interesting, but. I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think you're okay. Yeah. If it ends up being an issue, we can take a look at it here in a sec. All right. One last thing to get this up and running. We need to actually bring this config file. We need to run this file in our server so that we build that database connection. So let's go ahead and import big database.js again you'll note that we're not putting anything from this file into uh, a variable that we can use in our server all we're saying is hey go and run this file thank you so our program goes and we execute this database.js file that imports Mongoose and connects to the database. And then its job is done, and we move on with the rest of our application. So what we've just done is a thing that you're going to do over and over and over again. Anytime you build an app that connects to a database, you're going to need a .env file. That .env file is going to have a connection string inside of it. You'll also have a config database.js file where our da database connection is going to be established. Now, what you should be able to do at this point is start the application with Nodemon. And as long as you don't have any errors, things are good. But it would be really, really handy if we were able to confirm that we were actually connected to this database that we've set up here. I'd really like to just know and be certain that, hey, my app has started and I'm connected to a database. So what we can do is actually bring in a little shortcut here. Uh, if you are, if you do have errors, we will look at those here in a second. So uh, keep your hand up and I will get back around to you. Don't worry. Uh, so we're going to do mongoose.connection. This just creates a shortcut to this connection object, the whatever the connection is that we currently have mongoose connected to. We're just calling this database. So DB, and this is essentially like an event listener that we're constructing. So whenever we're connected to our database, I'm going to run this function. 
this function is just going to have a console log. of connected, hello, connected, connected to MongoDB. And then we can print out the database name here. We can also come in, we could put in a host and port number here, not wildly uh, concerned with this, but hey, we might as well do it. There's our host and here is the port. And now what we should see is that we are connected to MongoDB, our database name. And then here is our cluster information and then the port that we are connected on. All right. This is our database.js file in our config directory. Every single config database.js file is going to look exactly like this. This is not some syntax that you should be memorizing. You should copy and paste this from application to application. This file will never change. There is no need to write this from scratch. There's no need to memorize this. There's no need to do any of that. Again, focus on the things that are important. This file needs to exist. It needs to be imported into our server.js file. We need to have the .env line above this file, above where we're doing this import. Cool. All right. Let's talk about errors. Who's got some problems? Mike, what you got? Not, not sure. Cool. Uh, I just, Nodemon crashed, and I didn't... I just raised my hand because I was hoping we would stop long enough that I could read an error. Okay, but cool. If we're doing it anyway, can I just show you my screen and hopefully Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's just do it. All right. Not you either. I'm sorry. I always get the yeah. wrong screen. Totally cool. No big deal. All right. Well, let's make it big. Ah, okay, cool. Let me stop recording real quick. Um, can you push just in case we miss something? Absolutely, yeah. I'll do that now.
Um, does anyone here know how to troubleshoot a MacBook? <laughs> sure, what's up? So I am getting the lovely um, black screen of death. Um, and my MacBook is on, but the screen just refuses to function. Like if I plug it into my extra uh, monitor, that screen will work and I can use it, but it's like this specific screen refuses. The one on your MacBook? A really yes. dumb question. Have you tried closing your laptop for a couple seconds and then just opening it back up and it still doesn't work? Because I had that problem the other day where it, like it, my screen on my laptop wouldn't pop up and I was like, please don't do this. And I just closed it for a couple seconds and opened it back up. No, I've literally tried everything. Oh. Did you check the brightness on the screen? Yep, I checked the brightness and that's like shifting. I can see that. And like, if I do the hard reset, then it'll pop up. And at first it was saying like, you have a password problem. Like I need to reset it. So I reset it. And then. When, can, so two questions. Have you tried restarting it? And when you do, do you get the Apple logo when it restarts or is it just black? Yeah, and it goes down and then it just, the, then the screen goes away. Then. Is this all while you're still plugged into an extra monitor? No, I unplugged the extra monitor. Okay, so it's still doing that even though it's, it's not plugged into power. Hmm. And you verified your brightness is all the way. Yes. Up. Great. It's, uh... See, I don't know why I see. I'm not a Mac guy, but I seem to think that wasn't that connected to overheating pretty often I, I could be totally be wrong but i thought that might be the case I feel like hot feels like a little warm it could be loosely connected um display cables yeah. no so not if it's the not, not if it's the if the external monitor is working but the the one on your laptop that's it will, like it'll pop up the apple logo and then there's this tiny little like green line and then the green line the Apple logo will disappear and then the green line will like fade up and go away. Okay. And it does it every time. All right. So shut down your Mac. And when you turn it back on, immediately press option command P and R and hold that hold those down. And it'll reset your option command P and R. Hold on. Hi. I'm just gonna I don't know. Is lecture support a good channel? That seems like it. Yeah. Okay. There's a discussion yeah. thread with a different graphics issue, but there's a response from a uh, community moderator on discussions.apple. Option, command, P, and R. Mm -hmm. And that resets your PRAM, which resolves some graphics issues. Okay. All right, thank you. I'll try that. I wish I I wish I could show you. Maybe I just will. Like oh it's what, not. What, it, what it's saying on the Apple community is that it's a hardware issue with the L C D panel. Yeah. you see this it's asking me to reset my password it's saying choose the problem you are having when logging in this is the only time my screen will work well okay i mean that's good news because it means that it's not like the screen's not physically broken it's just an issue with the graphics yeah, it goes away again. ashlyn click the apple logo and then just do restart again you can uh, DM me and I can help you troubleshoot the Macs since I used to work with Macs. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> That's really cool. I'm working on the side too, so. It sounds like you have lots of resources though. Uh, if you end up needing more though, please let me know. Okay. Um, Let us continue. We're going to uh, dive into... Uh, ba, 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 ba. 
uh, we're going to dive into actually setting up a uh, schema in our project. Uh, that's going to be the first step for us actually compiling something into a model. Uh, so our schema is the blueprint for defining the structure, the data types, default values, any validation information, uh, any of that kind of things for documents within a MongoDB collection. Mongo schemas are used to enforce uh, some consistency and data validation whenever we're interacting with the database. That makes sure that the documents are adhering to a specific structure and that they contain valid data. That is the entire idea of our schema. It is going to make sure that we're putting good things into our database that we can be happy with and that conform to that schema that we have constructed. And you'll recall that the schema is the thing that gets compiled into the model. So, first thing we need to do is actually build out that file. And this means a new directory with a new file inside of it. Like we've got here, this is the wrong project. Where is the right project? Here's the right project. All right. So we've created a new models directory and inside of that directory, we've touched a todo.js file. So we have this. Just as a note, this is our final kind of directory structure that you're going to kind of see in an application like this. You're going to have a to do's view directory. We're going to have to do's routes. We're going to have to do's controllers. And then we're going to have a to do model. Note how this is singular, not plural. That is because what we export from the model is a singular thing. It is the to do model. That is the one thing that we get out of this file. With our controllers, we're exporting a collection of controller functions. With our routes, we're exporting a collection of routes. We will have many views. So all of these are pluralized because we have a lot of them that are being exported from each one of these files or directories. But our model is unique because for every single model file that we have, we are only exporting a one thing ever, a model, a singular model. But again, super note that what we've got in here is going to be consistent realistically for the rest of this unit. This is what we're going to stick with. We're going to have Controllers, models, routes, and views, all named basically around this to-do's resource. This allows us to have much better organization, allows us to be able to uh, kind of have a place where we can know that, hey, all of our controllers for to-do's live here. This is going to be an expansive idea as well. We are going to be able to continue building an application of realistically almost any size that we want by conforming to these rules. All right, so with that out of the way, what we're going to do is in this model file, we are going to define the schema compile that schema into a model and then export the model. So we're going to start by importing mongoose from mongoose. And then I'm going to create a shortcut to mongoose.schema. We don't have to do this, but um, 
it's something I'm basically always going to do just so that we don't have to write mongoose.schema everywhere where we want to use mongoose.schema. And instead, all we have to write is schema. That is all that this is doing. Just gives me a shortcut. Instead of writing mongoose.schema everywhere, I just write schema. So now that I've done that, I'm going to say const to do schema equals new schema. Again, this is where I would need to write mongoose.schema if I didn't have that shortcut. And this is going to have text as a string. This is it for now. So this is our schema. And just kind of looking at this, what I would like you to do next here is add in a new property called done and give it a type of Boolean. Uh, I'll give you a couple minutes for that. Um, I haven't had a you do in a hot minute here. So um, yeah, take a couple minutes and we'll have some fun time with uh this hey uh i have a quick question yeah um, Scott. how how do you open a second um notion like window or like instance yep if you're on mac you can use command shift in that will get you a new instance of notion um, you can also add in tabs up top as well. There's a little like plus button up here at the top that will allow you to have tabs if you would prefer to do things that way. You can also drag and drop into that tabs bar as well. You sure can. I've just been using such the basic setup. I'm this is this is blowing my mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Stephen. Yes, question. Um, so we don't need to know what dot schema does because that's what we just talked about last time. Um, but in terms of like knowing what parameters to pass, for example, so the dot schema takes a object as a parameter. That's just we'll get to know like the more commonly used ones, and we'll just kind of review them enough. Okay. Yep. So in here, um, let's say, um. Schema. So with this, let me, let me kill this actually. So mongoose.schema. Oh, I actually don't have autocomplete, which is kind of a pain here. Um, so what we can do, and we'll talk about this uh here in a hot minute, is we'll kind of look at the different options that you can do here. But essentially you're going to be passing in an object. Uh, and then if you want to, and we'll kind of explore this as we move on you can pass in a second object as well where you can have all of the options for this schema but we'll explore that later on we're just keeping that it basic for now second mongoose that's oh i thought they're always the scheme is always capitalized eh? okay I'm... schema is always capitalized yes it is a class so we're instantiating a new class here uh musto yes so essentially, could this be used to like create passwords and or like our like password check? So like if, if this password, like new password, password contains certain amount of strings or password contains these characters? Uh, not in this case. Okay. You could do something like that 
potentially, but not in this particular instance. Not so how you would use this. Okay. All right. That's probably enough time for you all to add in a new property on the object. I think we've kind of seen this stuff before. Uh, here, we're going to have a new field in here that is going to be called uh, done, and it's going to have a type of Boolean. And that fulfills this you do. So something to note here, as we've kind of started building something out here, this is the schema that our data is going to need to conform to. You can see that we have two of these kind of properties in here. These are going to be referred to as paths. You'll hear them referred to as fields. Um, you'll hear all kind of language used to describe this. In MongoDB land, this eventually turns into a field and document. So that is why you will have here it referred to as that. Um, you will often hear this referred to as a property because this is an object after all. Um, you can also hear this referred to as path um, because of kind of some legacy uh, things of, you know, how a, how you would build out a schema. Um, you'll, you'll hear this referred to as a lot of things. Use whatever language you want. We'll probably be able to figure out what you mean as long as you're using kind of one of those three words, property, field, path. Many times you'll hear us use property because these are really properties on objects, right? Uh, Melvin, question. Yeah, this might be a bit of a silly one, but um, I noticed, so with this schema, we're bringing in text, which lines up with the um, the array, the to-do's original data array that we had and the uh, Boolean of done equaling true or false. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't pull in, we don't need to do anything with the ID then in this case? Yes, this is not a silly question. This is a beautiful and wonderful question. Um, this, uh, whenever we create new documents in MongoDB, it handles all the stuff with underscore ID all on its own. We don't have to do anything. Uh, we don't need to specify it here. In fact, we should not specify it here. Um, we don't need to do anything. It is going to automatically create that because Mongoose knows, hey, if we're creating a document, we've got to have an underscore ID that is associated with that document. Uh, so that is, um, that's, kind of the reasoning behind that. Um, so, yeah, great question. Nick. So it, when we were defining a uh, to-do schema, and that's, I, I don't understand why we don't capitalize that since we're, we're defining a, a schema. Great question. This is um, really similar to whenever you would, uh, this is like instantiating any kind of class. This to-do schema is just going to be an object a singular object that was created based off of the specs that we passed in to this new instance of this class, this new class instance that we want to build. So this is an object, but this is a class. This object is constructed based off of what we put into that class. Okay, so we're going to have a bunch of to-do to -do schema objects with all of the pertinent information to them and the but created with the new schema class. Correct, but we will only have one of these schemas. That's the only note I would have on that. We only will build a singular schema. The okay. schema is then compiled into a model, which we'll get to here in a moment. Okay. Cool. All right, great question. So um, here we have our couple properties. And again, this matches as we've already pointed out here, this matches our existing to-do array. We've got over here, we've got text, and we have done. So what else could we put here? If we didn't have a string and we didn't have a Boolean, what other data types could we use? Well, we have these eight built-in data types that we can actually use in Mongoose. These top five, you're probably pretty familiar with. Strings, numbers, Booleans, dates, and arrays. 
pretty standard. But then we have some things that are actually unique to Mongoose. I'm going to tell you for now, you can entirely ignore these bottom two. You won't have to deal with them. This one right here, this mongoose.schema.types.objectID, this is a special type that exists for an object ID. Remember our object ID, as we talked about yesterday, that's this underscore ID thing. This underscore ID thing has a special data type all of its own. It's unique, it's special. Whenever we were working with this, we will typically treat it as a string, but it is important to kind of keep in the back of your mind because we will have to kind of fight against this at certain points that because this is its own unique data type, we're going to need to occasionally dip into a tool belt to be able to work with it, uh, especially whenever we want to compare it to another one. And again, we'll see that as we move through the rest of this unit. Just something to keep in the mind, keep in your mind uh, as we kind of learn this stuff. This is a special data type that does not exist in JavaScript. These other data types are actually lifted right out of JavaScript itself. These are built-in JavaScript data types. String, Boolean, number. They exist just identically to how they exist in JavaScript itself. So you can do all of the same things that you can do with JavaScript. All right. Again, these other two exist. I, you are not going to use them at this stage. Just know that they're there. You have that they're available to you, um, but I would super not worry about them. All right. We have a schema that we've constructed here. The next thing that we need to do is compile that schema into a model so that we can use it in the rest of our application. What that is going to look like is this const to do equals mongoose dot model passing in the string to do. And then the schema that we want to export to do schema. So as we talked about before, whenever we had our cat example up above, this is how we will refer to this model within our program as we are using it. This is what will be exported from this file. But Mongoose is also going to need to keep track of this model itself so that it knows how to look up this model if we ever need to. We'll see when this comes into play down the road. But this to-do string is just how Mongoose is going to know of this model. This is how we know of this model. These should always really be the same thing. There's no need to diverge from this and make them be separate. Uh, you can always just call them the same exact thing. And now we have a model. Remember, our model is how we are actually going to perform CRUD on our documents. We saw a create example earlier. So that would create a new document inside of the to-do collection. So let's export it so that we can actually use it. And this is the entirety of our model file. Whenever we do CRUD using this to-do model, it is going to be associated with the to-do collection in our database. We will be creating to-do documents using this to-do model that will live inside of the to-do collection. That will ultimately exist in our to-dos database.
All right. Now, one last bit of business here. Uh, we're going to skip viewing data because we don't have any data to view yet. Um, what I'm going to do now is actually um, use our model to actually read data that exists in our database. That's going to be the next thing that we do here. Um, Musto, you had a question? I did, but I I, I think I answered it. Um, I it, it was just mostly like uh, because like I noticed in the to do uh in in the model directory, um, you made three different cons uh constants, but I I was wondering if you could just make that into just one, like just do that all bunched up together, or do you have to make them into three separate ones? Um, you could. Hypothetically, or is there a benefit to doing it the way we did it here? This really just cleans up all of this um, and makes it really clear what is happening here. Okay. Okay, you, I see. you could hypothetically put all of this inside of this so you could replace to do schema here with this new schema and do it there. Um, I'm super like I I will gladly create variables if it makes it more clear as to what's going on at any given point in time in this app. I'm super not worried about like, hey, let's make a new variable so that we understand what our code is doing. Um, I would much rather do that than try to cram all of this into this, okay. honestly. Cool, thanks. Good question, though. Uh, Mike, yes. I was just looking at your code and noticed on line three and line five, you say const schema and then new schema, and those are different colors, and mine are the same. Is that just a themes issue? or It's a theme thing, yeah. Okay, they, but they are actually the same thing there. Yep, these are the same thing. Okay, got it. If you ever have a question about that, you can always come in here, and you can right-click and say... Um, that's actually not what I wanted. Right-click and say... Why don't I have this? Um, not change all occurrences. That's fascinating. I'm not getting my via, VS Code menu here either. Man, my VS Code's kind of weird today. Something's up. Um, Are you looking for you should definition? have. I'm not looking. I'm looking for change symbol. Your profile doesn't say GA in the bottom left. Should it? Uh, no, I'm on like, a, basically my profile is the GA profile. Um, it's weird. Huh. Um, I'll look into that and get back to you on why that's happening. Uh, but you should be able There's to go in update. here and you should have a change symbol thing. And that would typically allow you to kind of see what is referenced to what. Okay, um, let us continue on. We are going to use this model to read data. So we have a few different methods that we can go about um, actually reading data out of a database. And this is where we'll swing over and talk about uh, the mongoose documentation. Um, the mongoose documentation is, frankly, one of the worst pieces of documentation you will encounter as a beginner developer. Uh, it is not great. It is not very fun. Um, it is oftentimes lacking in clarity and kind of confusing. Um, it... it We'll give you some examples on how things work, uh, but it will be kind of internally inconsistent. It is a little, it, it, it's a little wonky. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it is kind of hard to navigate and it's, it's a bit of a journey to use, but it is honestly a really kind of good exploration into understanding what good and documentation is as kind of a beginner developer. Um, you've so far typically been encountering pretty good documentation with like MDN. MDN is like 
super fantastic. Uh, very, very good. Uh, you've potentially had to, you know, contend with some vocab issues as you've kind of been learning how to use it and stuff like that. But as a as, as a developer, it is one of the best resources that exists out there for just having good, well-written examples of how things work, um, of exactly what is happening um, with any part of a uh, particular function or method or anything like that. Uh, Mongoose is not going to be like that, the Mongoose docs. Uh, here, for example, we have the documentation for model.find. Model.find, just to summarize this for you, this is how you're going to find documents. That is what this documentation says. It finds documents, but you would probably want a little bit more detail than that I, I coming here and reading this, honestly. Um, you do get a little bit of documentation down here where we have some like, hey, let's find all of the documents. Hey, let's find documents that have a name of John, where John has an age of at least 18. We have this dollar sign GTE thing here, though, and who knows what that means. Um, and then we've got this dot exec. What's that for? Um, so we have some like weird stuff that is happening in here. So I will say that while the Mongoose documentation exists, it might give you a couple examples that might be kind of what you're looking for. Typically, whenever you're searching around on the internet for Mongoose stuff, Stack Overflow is going to be one of your best friends. You will oftentimes get clear explanations with better code examples on Stack Overflow than even their own, even the Mongoose documentation. So just gain that out now um and also realistically you'll get some good explanations in our write-ups as well for what is going on here so we're going to look at find that's going to be the first thing that we look at and the job of find is to return an array of all of the documents that match the query object the query object is this thing that exists inside of the parentheses, the thing that we pass into the find method. I will say probably 90% of the time, if not more, you'll be passing in an empty object here. And what that is going to do is find you all of the movies out of the database in this particular syntax that we have here. Whenever we do this in ours, it's going to find all of the to-dos out of the database. We also have find by ID. This is the next most common thing that you're going to be using. And here to find something by its ID, we are going to pass in the ID of the thing that we want to find. This is typically going to be on something called rec.params. We'll talk about this later on. But that finds a particular document by the ID that we've passed in here. Remember, the underscore ID is that big, long thing that I kind of showed you all yesterday, a uh, big, long string that is going to be unique to an item inside of your database. So whatever we say, find by ID, we have to have an object ID for the thing that we want to find available to us. And we'll see that whenever we get to that point, whenever we actually use this find by ID method later on. These top two are going to be typically what you're going to stick to, uh, but there is a find one method available as well. That is just going to find only one document, the first document that matches whatever you've queried for. Not used as often, but it exists. So, knowing what we know from up here, if I pass it, if I do to do dot find, I'm going to get all of the to dos, which is what I want. So, let's go ahead and talk about this. Let's write this, some code that's actually going to do this. In our model, we've exported 
our to-do model, and we can import it into our to-do controller. Right now, we're importing our kind of fake data that we're working with. We're going to do a new import for our actual to-do model. Model to do dot js. So again, to import from the to do model, I need to leave the controllers directory. Now I'm in express to dos, and I need to go into the models hello, models directory, and then I need to go into to do dot js, where we export this model this to-do model, allowing me to import that to-do model from this file. Me also, da, 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 da. there we go. We are going to get rid of this existing to-do data. All I'm doing right now is killing this import. We'll actually get rid of this file later on, uh, but Right now, we don't need that anymore. We're done with our temporary data. We've grown up. We're using databases now. So with this, how do we get our to-dos? Well, we're going to look at, hello, why can't I tap? Why are things broken? Apparently, I'm never going to be able to tap, but that's fine. Uh, let's do to do.find. And here, in to do.find, what I'm saying is find me all of the to dos. That is what this empty object is specifying. This is a filter. And essentially what I'm saying here is don't filter anything. That will find us all of the to-dos. Now, someone tell me, and I, this we might get here, we might not, that's fine. Someone tell me what kind of operation this is. This to-do.find. What has to happen? for us to get our to-dos back. Read? For the we have to read, the yes. Where, iterate. okay, perfect. Uh, not iterate. We do have to read. Where are we reading from? Mongoose. Or Mongoose is telling us to read from MongoDB. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Where is MongoDB? In the cloud. In the cloud, on the internet. That means that this process, what does this take? Time. Yes, time, time, time. So this request takes time we have to wait for it to happen it is going to essentially to us as human beings appear almost instantaneously there's almost going to be no delay for us at all but you'll remember back in da, 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 um this is not our high level overview this was um, intro to note. Remember, again, to us, this happens instantaneously. This might be like a 40 millisecond call that has to happen here. Probably between 40 and 80 milliseconds that happen. To us, this is no time at all. But to the computer, to the computer, this feels like something like four years are passing. We have to have the computer wait for this thing to happen. But we also don't want to stop execution of this program. 
we don't want the computer to have to sit there for four years and rot essentially right we wanted to be able to do other things we want to be able to accept other requests we want to be able to send replies we want to make other database queries we want to be able to interact with other users so this process is asynchronous i am telling mongoose hey go get me the to do's And I will wait on you to reply. But I'm going to be doing some other things in the meantime. Again, this is like sending a letter to somebody and you are like, you're waiting for a reply from them. If you were to send a letter to someone and then you sat and you did nothing and you didn't think about anything and you just turned off your brain and you just sat there and you waited for the reply to that message. That'd be a huge waste of time. We could be doing tons of other things. I could be eating. I could be making money. I could be like all of these things, right? That is what we need to tell the computer to do. I need to tell the computer, hey, while you're waiting for this other thing, go ahead, do whatever else you need to be doing. The way that we can, we have a couple of ways that we can actually accomplish this. The way that we're going to start with here is going to be called uh, dot then. That is going to indicate that this is an asynchronous process that we need to wait on before we execute any further code. Uh, Chris, question. Um, yeah, so is this a promise? Is this like generating a promise? Okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. This is generating a promise, and we'll kind of circle back on that idea here in a moment. So here, what we're saying is find the to-dos, and then whenever we have the to-dos back, I want you to execute some task. What is the task that we're going to want it to execute whenever we have to-dos actually available to us? What do I want to do now? I've got the to-do data. What do I do with it? Render it. Exactly. I want to render it. I want to send that data that I've collected to a view so that I can then respond to my user with a fully rendered view that has all of the data that the user wants. In this case, that's going to be all of the to-dos. So let's move this. Uh, let's get it out of there, into here. So what is happening here? Again, we're just gonna take this step-by-step. Step. I'm telling Mongoose to go and talk to someone else, somewhere else. Make a request out on the internet for to-do data. And then when we have to-do data, whenever that process is ended and we've gotten a reply, go ahead and respond to the user using that data that we retrieved. And pass that data to our to-dos index view as to-dos. Uh, yes, Calum. So in using that, it, it strikes me that like, we, we have to know what find is gonna return in order to then accurately pass the right stuff to then. Like mm -hmm. if let's say find returned I don't know, an array. Uh, I mean, it is an array, but let's say it returned three things instead. Like we could pass then three things instead of one thing. Like, is that how this works? That you, whatever you're getting back is going into the then function? Yes, um, that is how this will always work. So here, whenever we have called, whenever we have sent this, whenever we use dot find, we will always be getting back an array. 
we are always, even if it's only a single item, it will come back to us as an array because we are, because we kind of have this limitation, right? Of whatever I'm getting back here needs to be kind of this generic data type. And here we just say it's going to be an array because that is what our mongoose document is going to send back to us. It is finding documents, not to document. Mm. So we are expecting back out of this an array. Um, and uh, it, that's one of the things that this could probably be a little bit more clear in the documentation about. Here we get the, the returns a query, but we don't really see the data type of that, but it is always going to be an array in this case. Can I ask uh, one so, more quick one? Yeah, totally. Um, so is the use of the dot then turning find into an async function or is find defined async as an async function by mongoose? And we're just, we know that implicitly. Great question. Find is defined by mongoose as an asynchronous function. So we know by default, whenever we use dot find, this is going to be asynchronous. This so we can't just dot then whatever we want. Like exactly. dot then has to be paired with a function that is defined as asynchronous. Yes, exactly. So okay. just mild language clarification there though. This is, and this goes back to the question earlier. Uh, this is technically going to be called a promise. Uh, so that that is what this is going to return to us is a promise. Um, and a promise is able to be a promise is what is called venable. So we can do this chain of dot then. So this promise that this returns, just like um, remember back in unit one, uh, say I had like some uh, Say we have a collection of to-dos, right? And I'm doing to-dos.map, and I'm doing some map function. I'm able to chain more onto this. I can say map something and then filter it. That is essentially what is going on here, is I know that map returns an array. And I know that I can filter something off of an array. Same idea is happening here. I know that to-do.find is going to return a promise. And I am able to chain dot then onto a promise. So to do dot find is a promise or it is, is a method that returns a promise. It is a method that returns a promise. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Great questions. Cool. Uh, Steven. So the, um, sorry. So it's fine it's the dot, dot then that makes it a promise then or because so, to do go ahead yeah just because to do dot find if that returns like a promise needs to is that based on just from the wording of promise that like it's going to do something later right if found like if it, if it hits a variable so then is it the dot then or other similar things that make it into a promise because to do dot find is just a Mong MongoDB method, right? Yeah, exactly. This is a MongoDB method that returns a promise. Okay. That That is the key out of here. So just like if I did some map on some array, I know that this returns an array. Right. And on an array, I can do a filter method. Yes. So just like with this, how I know dot .map returns an array so I can return a filter or so I can... Uh, do filter on an array, I know that to do dot find is going to return a promise, which I can then do this dot then method on. The And the last thing is the dot then, you've put that on line five just for sake of clarity, or yes. is that best practice? Yep, this is just sake of clarity. It is what we will use for everything. Uh, it, you can throw this here. Th that is possible. Uh, but uh, your queries will often, uh, this kind of personally obfuscates things a little bit to me. I think this is much clearer as to what is going on here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But this is purely syntactical. You can write this like this. It will function exactly the same. 
Great questions. Cool. One last thing on this, because this is a promise. Promises have two states that we can get out of them. A promise can be resolved and a promise can be rejected. We have these two possibilities that exist. We have two diverging paths. When a promise is resolved, it is going to call this dot then. When a promise is resolved, things went well. Everything went as we wanted it to. When a promise is rejected, then what it is going to call is not the dot then, but instead a new chain that we can add here called dot catch. And this will receive an error, the thing that went wrong. So here we could say catch the error. And if there is an error, I'm going to console log it. Console log error. And I'm going to res.redirect somewhere else. I came up with a really good analogy for catch. And uh, then if you if you want to share that, if I can share that with everybody. So sure, go ahead. Dot then and dot catch are like David and I. So think of me as dot then. I'm going to get shit done, but shit is going to fall through the cracks. And that is why I have David as my dot catch because he catches all of the errors that I make and fixes things. So think of it like that. You can't have a dot then without a dot catch or else if you have a problem, what are you going to do? You always have to have a David around to solve the problem. So think of David as the catch and think of me as the then. And you will never forget that ever in your lives. Yep. I came up with that on the fly. I'm so proud of myself. I'm so proud of you, Ben. Uh, okay, cool. So the, you, another way that you can think of this is kind of a, a take my branching paths that we have earlier. Um, we have the dot then. This, this is basically if everything goes well. And then we have the dot catch that is if problems happen. Only one of the, you'll only go down one of these paths. You're going to go down the then path or you're going to go down the catch path. That's why we need to still respond at the end of both of these. Because at the end of the day, we have to send the user some kind of response to the request that they made. This is the most basic possible stripped down way that you can do error handling here. There is a ton of different error handling situations that you could handle here. A ton. We are not going to dive too much into that. We are going to focus more on, hey, let's at least understand what our errors are by console logging them. But there's a ton that you could do in a dot catch. We're, again, not really going to explore that in any kind of depth, but just know that there you could do all kinds of things at a dot catch if you wanted to, but this is kind of where we're going to leave it. Most of our dot catches are going to look exactly like this here. Most of what we will be changing will be inside of our dot thens. This just ensures that we at least see errors when they happen so that we're able to debug them more effectively. I will also say you could just not put that here. You could have just exclude that dot catch entirely. If you do that though, you will get errors and have no idea what they are. And you will have no response to what happens whenever those errors happen. So anytime that we write a dot then, we will also be writing a dot catch. So that we can actually see our errors when they happen and not be totally in the dark as to why programs are failing. All right, a couple questions. Mike. So I know you just said that we're not really going to get into it, but mm -hmm. to satisfy my curiosity, I assume that somewhere there is a, a period of time defined to catch timeout errors that makes dot catch trigger after a certain period of time. So is that Mongoose doing that? 
It is actually, yes. So if you have a request in here that I believe by default takes longer than 10 seconds, that will be caught by this dot catch. Um, and that is the error that you'll see here in this console log is timeout occurred to uh, 10 milliseconds or, or uh, sorry, 10,000 milliseconds have passed. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the default time, uh, but yeah. Neat. All right. I was just curious where that came from, not like actual details about it. Yeah, but... yeah, 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 yeah. It will come from Mongoose. Mongoose handles uh, all of your errors that you get here will typically be Mongoose errors. Got it. That you'll be able to see. Uh, Steven. Just really quick. Uh, is it always binary? Can it be like, can can you, instead of just mm -hmm. dot then dot catch, can you have multiple branches? Uh, so you can. Um, there is another branch that goes off of this that we actually don't talk about at all. You have a dot finally that exists. Uh, this would happen after either one of these happens. Um, that that's another path that you can go down here. You can also get to a point where you have multiple dot thens and multiple dot catches that are kind of like nested. Um, that's where things get complicated and not as fun. Um, but it, you will see examples of us doing that in code for sure. Um, I will say also, just while we're talking about this, this is one method of writing asynchronous code. Um, there's another kind of more modern method that we will touch on at some point uh, that is called async await. Um, same idea is happening in both of them. We have to wait on something to happen, right? Um, so your structure is going to be the same, uh, but just kind of to give you a little preview of where things will eventually go, there is there are other ways of doing this um, that are a little bit more modern. Uh, but this is a really good kind of baseline to be able to understand uh, what is happening in our code. And I, 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 I like this a lot because it is very much um, this reads like English, right? Like find all the to do's. And then when we have the to do's do this thing and catch any errors that we have along the way, and then do this thing. So this is, Again, one of the methods that we have available to us, I think that this is a little bit easier to catch up at the start while you all are learning about promises, but we will see other examples later on. Um, any last questions before we wrap up on this? Very good. Cool. Um, let's see if this works. What have we got? If I swing over to my to-dos, do a quick little refresh. Look at that. We have some to-dos. You won't have to-dos in your database yet. You have not created any. I'm using a pre-existing database from my .env, so um, this that, that is why I have data here. You should not see anything here at this point. But you should also not have any errors down in your terminal. And if that is the case for everyone, then we can go ahead and go on lunch. If anyone does have errors, I'm happy to stick around and fix those up. But if not, I'm going to send you all on lunch. And we'll be back here in about an hour. Uh, Kelsey, yes. I have a 404 error. I love a 404 error. Let's check it out. Um, okay. So we're at localhost 3000 slash to do's and we're not hitting this function. So anytime that we have a 404 error for now and always, it means that we do not have a route that it corresponds with what we're trying to go to. Um, so let's check that first. Uh, our, our routes start in our server.js file. So let's start there and make sure that we have our to-dos router set up. And it looks like we do on line 13. We have our routes coming from there. So that's good. Can we scroll down to where you're mounting your routes? Don't you need okay. a .js after your uh, config at the top? Ew. Yes, that would be cool. 
I don't think that will break anything here. Can we actually, yeah, throw one on your, yep, 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 right there too. Cool. Try a refresh just out of curiosity. Nope. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Um, let's check out your routes, your to do's router. Cool. Um, that totally looks right. Um, we have a. Wow. So oh the no. The oh thing. no, it's the wrong oh, server God. that's running. Okay. It's like everything here looks perfect. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna close that and then make sure that the other one does work because apparently all my code is running. So that that's cool. <laughs> How fun. Good catch, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I just pointed out <sighs> a joke that underlined in a bad color. <laughs> <laughs> It was I a bad color. I'm oh, sorry. What's the least accessible <laughs> color I can use? To highlight this I, I literally didn't even see it. That's funny. Uh, that so. is... <laughs> um, I'm getting a Nodeman, Nodeman crashed. Uh, okay. When... Let's check it out. Yeah, I got you. Uh, it says that this does not provide an export name to do. Um... Cool. Um, you are cool. Let's read our error that we've got down here. We are the requested model module uh, data slash to do dash data dot js does not provide an export named to do. Uh, so here, what that's saying is from this file that we're in right now, we don't yeah. have a to do export, which we would not want. Uh, right. okay. We want to uh in our controllers be importing our model so let's swing over to our controller and then change and instead to... of instead of eh, go back no. go back go back yep so instead of importing from this place we want to import our model so where where does our model live uh in our to do in our models directory exactly yes so then so... we want to import that instead I exactly Okay. Uh, to do .js. .js. Perfect. Although it doesn't look like you're exporting to do from your model either. So you may want to go swing back to that real quick. Oh. Oh, no. Yep. Got to have to do on oh. line 13. <laughs> and that would help. Should I think link it up? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for um, sure. Yes. Cool. Cool. Very I good. Appreciate nice. it. Of course. Great work, everybody. Have a good lunch. <laughs>